I'm glad you're here. If you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to go to the Old Testament to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 17. And I want to tell you a little story. It's about a young boy who was trying to sell his push lawnmower because it was always his dream to have a riding lawnmower. So he put it out in the front lawn when a Baptist preacher came along and wanted to buy it. Does it run? asked the pastor. Well, yes, it does, said the boy. So the preacher tried it out. He pulled and pulled and pulled some more, but nothing happened. He said, son, this thing doesn't run. It won't even start. The boy said, well, listen, I had to realize that to get it started, I had to learn to cuss at it. The preacher said, you got to be kidding. I'm a Baptist pastor. I haven't cussed in 18 years. The boy said, keep pulling. It'll come back to you. (laughs) Now, I say that because I think there's a lot in this that's true in life. It's easy to get distracted by something we want of the world. And if we're not careful, we'll get so involved that we think we need it. We think we want it. We think it has something to offer that eventually our old nature comes back out and everything that we've been focused on, we end up losing in the end. Isn't that true? That was quiet. Let me me explain it another way. If you don't keep your eyes on Jesus, you're going to get all wrapped up in the world once again. If you're not in the word, you're going to be in the world. You can't have it both ways. Church, you need to understand this. We need to get this. Our world has dramatically changed. Has anybody figured that out yet? And I hope you're not just thinking about the younger generation. I hope that you're looking in the mirror because I believe it this in my life and it's true in yours. The greatest enemy is the person you look at every day in the mirror. And we've learned and been taught so many things that isn't the church anymore. We're living out a Christian life that isn't even Christ-like anymore. We've got this idea that we get offended. We want to hear things that make us feel good. We don't want to grow. We don't want to be challenged. We somehow want to walk in the gym and five minutes later we walk out buff and fit. It's better to look at the weights than pick them up. It's better to criticize someone else who's working out saying, man, what are they doing? There's better things to do. It's just so easy, is it not? I mean, that's that's the world we're becoming. I don't say that to be disrespectful. I'm telling you it's where it's at. We we can sit and keep pushing it off, but there's a battle going on. It's between heaven and hell, and we've got to fix ourselves and decide which side we're going to be on because you can't play in the middle. Somewhere the words of Jesus have got to matter. When Jesus says, you're not hot towards me, you're not cold, you're lukewarm. And Jesus said, you're like vomit out of my mouth. Now, those are in the Bible. Jesus said that you can't have two masters. You want to live in the world? That's your, that's your God. I won't play. Second, I won't play a part. I'm the Lord thy God. It is my way or it is no way. That's what the Bible says. Now, we can stop and go, but I don't believe that. Then I'm not mad at you. That's okay for me. But at the end of your life, you've got to decide what really matters. If you want to build your life on quicksand, then build it on quicksand. But don't blame the world when you're sinking and drowning. Everything is a choice. Who you marry, how you raise your kids, where you work, what you think on. You're the one responsible for it. No one made you do that. And that's what this series is all about. A real McCoy is taking ownership getting over yourself and under God, getting broken rather than trying to build yourself up. And when all that begins to happen, God begins to do what he said he would do. I will be your God, but you've got to be my people. And I want, I, I, I'm telling you, I still believe that revival can happen. But it won't happen based upon our understanding. It won't happen if you get, keep getting offended by what someone else says rather than us looking into the Word of God and starting to say, I want to be like Jesus. That's what this series is about. It's what it's about. And so if you're a guest, I'm glad you're here. I really am. It thrills me. If you're watching online, I'm so glad you're here. And I want to tell you, I've loved this series because if you always want to know what I'm going through, then watch what I preach. Because I can tell you, six months to a year ago, that's where I was at. 
I had a daughter who went through some struggles. I'm not here to tell you her story. She loves to tell it herself. But I will tell you, when you go through those, there's a lot of stuff that begins to happen. And one of the things that I began to realize and recognize in my own life is, God, I want to be the real McCoy. I don't want my joy and happiness based upon whether my kids are doing what I think they should or not. I don't want my joy and happiness depending upon the fact that my wife is being the wife she needs to be for me. I don't want my joy and happiness being determined by a church and whether the people like me or not. God, I want to be the real McCoy. I want to know what it's like to really seek you with everything and quit reading the word but start living it. Instead of reciting it and playing pretend to actually believe it's real. When he says, you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Not with part of your heart, with all your heart. And this is what this series has been about for me. I don't want to be governed by my finances to think somehow money will make me happy. If you didn't hear last week's message, I would encourage you because we didn't talk about tithing. We didn't talk about giving. We just looked at what does God think about it? And what if we started thinking like he thought? But I'm learning so much as I look at the church and my dad is right after 80 years of living. Right now in America, Christianity is being erased and the church is the one doing the erasing. And if we could get broken and repent before God and seek him, I think God would begin to do something that would just blow our minds that we really, really want. I will say it again, revival isn't going to happen out there. And the church has got to quit attaching itself to something and thinking they're a part. It's time for them to lead the way and invite everybody else in. And church, this is what this series is really all about. It's what it's really all about. So we've been talking about how do we get healthy? What would it be like if we could really think like God when it comes to our spiritual lives and to own that? What would it be like physically if we understood this is truly a temple of God and we started getting broken before God with it? What if we could really get healthy emotionally and quit living by feelings? And what does it mean to really walk by faith? What would it be like to be mentally healthy, to renew our minds and to think the things that God thinks of? As Paul said, think of the only things that are lovely and beautiful and pure and right. What would happen? Well, I want to talk now about, in wrapping up this series, what does it mean to be missionally healthy? And I don't know some of you are going, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to explain it to you, and I think you'll get it. But what does it mean to be missionally healthy? I want you to look up at the screen. And again, I, I just want to share with you, I can only speak out of the Word of God as the truth and the authority for my life. I'm not trying to preach it to you to somehow put you on the defense. I can only speak to you what I believe to be is true. You have all the right to sit here and go, I'm not sure I believe that. That is your choice, but everybody here believes something, and the question is, what you believe, is it getting you where you really want to be? And so I'm not trying to put him in defense. I trust the Word of God with everything I got. And I don't really trust me anymore much. My dad used to say something that used to really tick me off, to be honest with you, and then it started frustrating me, and then now I completely agree with him. But early on, he would say, the older I get, the fewer the absolutes. And I'd say, Dad, that doesn't make sense. It seems to me the more you would study the Word of God, there would be more absolutes. And he said, absolutely not, son. Someday you'll get it. And there used to be all kinds of things that really mattered to me. I'm going to tell you, I really agree with my dad. The older I get, the fewer the absolutes. There's only one thing that matters to me, Jesus Christ and his word. Nothing else really matters. Nothing else really matters. I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll vote, don't really care in the end. Because I just don't believe legislation changes a heart. See, it's not, I, I won't die on that one. I'm not going to die on whether the Vikings win a Super Bowl or not. If you're a Viking fan, I hope they do. And just maybe way winning the Super Bowl might finally heal your marriage. Notice I'm not smiling because I think there's some guys who think that. And maybe them winning the Super Bowl might actually get your kids going in the direction you finally wanted them to go. And maybe them winning the Super Bowl, maybe finally for the first time financially you'll experience some freedom that you've always wanted. 
or just maybe that if you can finally win that lottery, it'll heal your marriage. And just maybe if you go to all your kids' games and chase them all over the world, maybe that'll get them in the direction that one day they'll build their marriages on the rock of Jesus. See, all of that stuff is all part of life. I'm not saying being there for your kids. I'm just telling you what God taught me in life is this. I will no longer chase my kids. I'm going to chase the name of Jesus. Because watch this. That doesn't mean I neglect my kids. It's through Jesus that I discover what real love means to love my kids. And I'm just trying to really understand what it means because God loves my kids more than I ever will. He loves my marriage more than I'll ever love it. Everything about my life, and I want to show you what Jesus says, but you need to understand the first part. So look at the screen. I want everybody to read this loud with me. Read it with me. It's in God's Word. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Stop there. Jesus is speaking here. There is a thief in the world. There's a thief in your life. He has but three things that he wants to do. To steal, to kill, and destroy. Watch this. And some people go, that doesn't make sense. To kill and destroy is the same thing. No, it's not. It's much bigger. Satan understands something about my life and he understands about your life. He comes because he wants to steal my identity that I forget who I am and whose I am. And by doing that, he'll eventually kill the person I am. But in the death of means, means there's destruction that follows because my life does make a difference. And so does yours. Nobody here lives in isolation. Every life was purposed by God to make a difference. You might think you're in isolation, but in isolation, you're affecting other people. So he wants to steal my identity. He wants to kill my life because when I'm gone or I'm living a life that's sinful, the ripple effects begin to hurt other people as well. And that's when destruction happens. That's all he wants to do. And he'll do everything and anything to wreck your life. And church, I want you to listen. And he's stronger than any human being ever created except one. In the status of strength, there is God, there's Jesus, there's the devil, and there's mankind. And the only way we defeat the devil is through Jesus Christ, the victorious one. And when we seek him, oh my goodness, the devil has to flee. So look what he says. Jesus says, the thief comes. People hear this. He wants to steal your identity. He wants you to figure out who you're not. He wants to kill your life. And in doing that, it will destroy others. But now watch what Jesus says. Read it with me. Come on, church. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Church, that's what I want. And that's what this is all about. Being the real McCoy. So I'm going to share with you something in a story that's very familiar with a lot of us that grew up in church, but I'm not sure we've ever had the right translation of it. I think we've missed it a little bit. Because the moment I started going through what I was going through, David became the focus of my life to figure out what would it be like that one day in Scripture, God would say, Keith Loy, a man after my own heart. For that's the only one that God ever said it about. And that was David. David, a man after my own heart. And yet we know that David made some choices he shouldn't have made. But it's how he responded to those choices that made the difference. He didn't shove them under the bridge. He put them on the cross. He didn't try to hide them and impress man. He wanted to be broken before God. And God used him in unbelievable ways, even though he went through some very difficult things. And I want to be like that. I want to be like that. And one of the things that I've learned is, is that Satan's number one thing that he likes to do, where Peter describes him as a lion who wants to devour people. And one of the ways he does that is by creating giants. And I want to help you with this as we're wrapping up, because I'm going to share with you some things out of the story of David and Goliath that I think we've missed A story that somehow we use as a metaphor. And it's been taught so many times how to overcome incredible odds. How to be a one in the million type of person. Because you've got a boy who's an underdog. 
taking on a giant who's the big dog. You've got a shepherd defeating a warrior. Hefty, 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 taking on wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. You got a man covered in armor and the other one wearing tights. Something's missing here. And so we preach the story of how to take on your giants, but I think we've missed it. I don't think we've got it. Because the more I read it and the more I look at Scripture as a whole, instead of taking a story out of its context, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. And I'm convinced now that David was not the underdog and giant Goliath was the big dog. I think all he had was a big bark, but he had no bite. And all along, David was actually the warrior. And I want to help you with that. Because I think too often we approach our lives and we want to be like David, but the only problem is we're taking out of context. I think we need to be like David, but we need to understand who David was. See, I want to share this with you, and I want you to catch this. And if you've got your notes, you can take them out, but there's three things you need to understand in the ancient world about armies. And you might want to write it down because there was always three waves of soldiers that would go into every battle. And the first wave was the cavalry. These were the ones that rode in the chariots. Then there were the foot soldiers, like Goliath, who wore full body armor and carried a sword. And for the most part, they were naturally big, at least physically. But then there was a third wave called the artillery, which is very important for us to understand because I want to tell you a little bit about the artillery. They were made up of people who had bows and arrows and slingshots. See, a slingshot was a leather pouch that had two long ropes attached to it. You'd put a rock in the middle, whirl it around your head, let go of one of the ropes, and the rock would be propelled forward to hit your target. One of these trained soldiers who had a slingshot could literally hit birds flying through the air. It's very known through history. You can read about that. See, an experienced slinger, as they were called, would rotate it around its head about six to seven times a second, which means it would be traveling about 35 meters per second. And if Goliath was 100 feet from David, that rock would hit him before Goliath even knew what had happened. The rock that David picked up was of barium sulfate, a common rock in the valley of Elah of David would have known. It was a very hard, dense rock which would have the stopping power back in that day equal to a bullet coming out of a 45 caliber handgun. David knew this. And some of you would say, I think that's speculation and hearsay. I think in a moment you might disagree. But then there's Goliath, a warrior, so we think, who stands on the cliffs and all he's doing is spouting words. Remember that. We don't even know what he could do because we never got to see it. We make assumptions. Therein lies the problem. But if you read the story, this warrior had to be led onto the valley floor by an attendant. I just find that interesting. Why would that be? Because all he was saying is, you send your best, I'm the Philistine's best, and let's have a fight. And the reason he would say that, because it was very typical in battle when both armies were paralyzed, that two of the best, so to speak, would come into the valley, they would battle, and ever who would win, the other loser would have to concede and thus surrender. But yet the warrior had to be led on to the valley floor. The Bible tells us he moved rather slowly, and it seemed to take him a while to figure out who David was, and what David was up to. Now you say, why would I say all that? Because believe it or not, there's a group of people called endocrinologists who study the scriptures. This is what they do all of their lives. They just look at the scriptures and they study it and they put it in context. 
And they research in ways that you and I can't even imagine. And what they discovered is quite interesting. For instance, obviously Goliath was huge. Scripture tells us, some translate it was over nine feet tall. Some translate, when you look at the measurements of that day, that he was definitely over seven feet tall. Regardless of the fact, when you get over seven feet tall, you're kind of a lone wolf. There's not many people like that. You're considered a giant. Would you agree? He's a big man. But there's a reason for it. It's called acromegaly. It's an anomaly caused by a tumor on the pituitary gland. In turn, it creates an overproduction of human growth hormones, thus creating a giant physically. But one of the common side effects, almost in every one who has this anomaly, is the tumor grows so large that it compresses on the optic nerve and it restricts vision which I find interesting, maybe why Goliath moved slowly. Maybe why he had to be led on to the valley floor down an embankment. Why it took him a while to figure out what David was up to. And probably why in the story he keeps telling David, come to me, come to me. Because Goliath knows the only way he can have victory if it's in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And David knows this too. If this man gets a hold of me, I'm going to meet Jesus today. <laughs> but don't miss this. So David did what you and I should do. I need to be me. And how God trained me and how God raised me. Victory comes when you understand who you are and you're unbelievably blessed by how God made you. And you don't try to be something you're not. It's an incredible moment, but I say all this because some of you might be arguing right now, okay, that's just a bunch of hearsay. Listen, you don't have to believe the experts. I'm not trying to propagate that. I'm only saying everything I just said to say this. Obviously, you ready for this? Giants are not always what they appear to be. Giants aren't always what they seem. And in keeping with our story, obviously every giant can be defeated. But I want to help you with that. I want to show you something. I want to show you four giants that David had to face. But I want you to listen now very carefully as I'm wrapping up what it means to be missionally healthy. What does it mean to stay on point? What does it mean to live the life that God has given you to live and to live it as the real McCoy? All four of these giants will work when it comes to your finances. All four of these giants will work when it comes to your relationships. All four of these giants will work when it comes to your mental and emotional stability and health. All four of these giants. And yet David defeated every one. But watch this. This is not a message on how to defeat giants. And I'll share that with you in a minute. But why was David able to defeat the giant that day? Well, here's the first thing you need to understand that's going to come into your life. It's called the giant of delay. Say that with me. The giant of delay. And we're going to struggle with this one because we live in a microwave world today. Have you ever noticed that? And we like the microwave. We like it in every way we can because not only do we want it now, we can get it now. We don't have overnight delivery anymore. We have same day delivery. And we still wonder where our package is. It's interesting, isn't it? Drive through services. And yet we're always frustrated with the person in front of us. Quick lubes. We want to get our car in and car out, but did they do the job that we really want? Come on, people. Anybody ever sat here saying my internet is too slow? <laughs> Just a few of you honest people. Folks, patience has become a dying institution. That's why I said earlier, the church. I was with our mayor this morning on the treadmill. Not the same one. <laughs> just realized what I just said. <laughs> but we were talking about the fact 
about our churches. And we were talking about where he goes to church. He said, you know, Keith, it's the first church when my wife and I moved to town that we went to. So how long have you been there? He says, 19 years. I said, we don't live in that world anymore, do we? And he goes, no, it's sad. You can't count on many people anymore. Even in the church, we want it now. We want the entertainment. And we'll forge so much for what we want that we'll sacrifice the relationship of what God wanted us to have. Somehow that's got to change people. The giant of delay. Drew Benive of Benvi, founder of the communication agency, Batten Hall, says there's actually a positive wanting everything now. He says it lets us complain more quickly. <laughs> but folks, when you listen to this, when God calls us to do something and it's worthy of God's calling, it will never happen today. Did you catch that? When God calls us to do something, there's always a waiting period. If he calls you to do something today, I guarantee you he will not fulfill it tomorrow. Nowhere in scripture you'll ever see that. And there's many, many reasons why. But most often you need to catch this. The waiting period of God will probably take years. Who wants to wait for years, which is the problem. But anything worthwhile to God is worth the while. Because we don't even recognize that we do the same thing with God. Our prayer life is microwaved. Oh, God, help me now. And I hear Christians come and go, I prayed. God didn't answer. And they wonder why they struggle with being the real McCoy. Here's a thought for you. Maybe God's not going to answer your prayer in your generation. Maybe it'll take three or four of them. Because God's picture of eternity is much bigger than my temporal life on earth. And maybe he needs you to do something now that 300 years from now he's going to fulfill. Amen. That just doesn't sound good, does it? But the Bible says, look at 1 Samuel 17 if you've got your Bibles and look at verse 12. David was the youngest of Jesse's eight kids David, his three older brothers enlisted in Saul's army, but David was held back. David was held back to care for the sheep in Bethlehem. And you stop and go, I get that, he's the youngest, but no, no, you don't understand. He's already been anointed as God's next king. God already pulled him out. God already put his hand on him through the prophet and said, you will replace Saul. I don't know about you, but if I'm David, I'm kind of ready to be king. God already said it, but God goes, no, you're going to be the next king, but right now I just want you to take care of some sheep. But isn't that what the Bible says? Those who wait on the Lord get renewed strength. I want the renewed strength stuff, folks. I'm tired of trying to do it in my own strength. Those who wait upon the Lord... God's timing, the giant of delay. Here, here's the second giant. It's called the giant of discouragement. Legend has it that Satan decided to have a yard sale. He wanted to get rid of a number, a number of his weapons like envy, deceit, malice, sens sensuality, Iowa. Anyway, and, he, he, <laughs> and, and, and so he sold them. He sold them for very low prices so he could just get rid of them. But there was one in the yard sale that was marked extremely high. It was called discouragement. Someone asked the devil why. He said, this has been my most successful weapon. It wears people down more than any other. And when I can wedge it in someone's mind, they fail every time. Look at our story again, verses 8 through 10. Day after day, day after day, after day after day, Goliath taunted the army of Israelites. And we stop and go, man, I'd be wore down too. He's not doing anything. He's just standing on the other side of a valley, taunting. All he has is a big bark. We have no clue if he has a good bite. 
day after day. And the Bible says that when Saul and his army heard this, they were deeply shaken and paralyzed with fear. One translation translates it this way. They couldn't do anything. Folks, listen, I don't know what your giants in your life are telling you. I just don't think what they're saying is a big deal. It's what you're believing they're saying that's the big deal. You open up your checkbook and go, oh, ah, how are we going to make it? How are we going to make it? You look at your relationships and go, oh, man, they don't love me. They don't love me. I have all these bad thoughts. I have all these bad thoughts. I have all these bad thoughts. I'm just a wreck. I'm just a wreck. I'm just a wreck. All they are is words. Giants aren't what they seem. What is God saying about you? Either God is true to his word or he is a liar and we're the most ridiculous people in the world. But I think he's for real. And he is God. Oh, that giant. Who are you listening to? How about the third giant, the giant of disapproval? I don't know about you, but I want to be liked. I like to be approved, especially by those closest to me. But if we're going to stay the course and be missionally healthy with our lives, there's always going to be a critic. There's always a critic. And in David's case, it was his own family. Look at verses 28 through 29. His brothers asked, why are you even here? They don't say, hey, Dave, hi. Why are you even here? Watch what they say. Why aren't you taking care of your scrawny little flock of sheep? Folks, listen, it's one thing to diss David, but who, do, who kind of person are you after diss sheep? <laughs> I think those kind of people are like really bad. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just like stupid. But listen to this. One thing, when you're trying to do your best, it really hurts when someone says your best isn't good enough, doesn't it? And then those that are doing it are those that are closest to you. But here's the good news. You're not alone. Jesus himself. Did you know that not one of his stepbrothers or stepsisters believed that he was Savior and Lord till after his resurrection? His own family. What was it like for Jesus to be on the cross dying and not one of his family members are there? that he has to give his mother to one of his best friends. They wouldn't even show up to watch their brother die. Talk about the giant of approval and disapproval. How about the giant of doubt? Look at verses 32 through 33. Don't worry about a thing, David told the king. I'll fight the Philistine. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can go against this Philistine. Watch what he says. You're only a boy. You're just a boy. And we've all heard that word in so many other ways. But I just find that interesting. You're only a boy. And yet when you read the Bible, the mark of maturity is never in the title of manhood. It's always written in the title of childhood. <laughs> Do you know that? And we spend all of our time. I mean, let me, let me tell you what a boy is. You ready for this? It, this, to me, is the evidence of a boy. You need to turn 21 so you can go out and be a drink and be stupid. <laughs> Son, you shouldn't use adult language, but when you get my, my age and you're a man, you can cuss like ever. I just find that interesting. Because I'm going to read to you what Jesus said. Jesus said this, unless you change, and this is in the actual translation of what Jesus really said, unless you change and become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? So let me go back to the earlier question. Why was David able to defeat Goliath? I'm going to offer you something because I, want you to, I don't want you to miss this. I think it was not because of his present moment faith, but actually because of our series, it was because of his 
prepared faith well before he ever got in the battlefield. When you read David's life, before he ever met Goliath, he was already financially healthy. He was relationally healthy. He was emotionally, physically, and spiritually healthy. David was the real McCoy. Because David understood this. You'll never do in performance what you haven't done in practice. See, see, a lot of people come to the church. I need Jesus. Why? Because my marriage is coming apart. No, no, no. Forget your marriage. You need Jesus. Church, I I need Jesus. My kids have gone straight. No, 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 no. I know your kids are straight, but you just need Jesus. And he's a good God when he does what we request. And somehow it requires at that moment that we must be healthy. But I think... The devil has seduced us. And church, this is what this series is all about. Listen to this very carefully. Giants are a part of our journey. They're not the journey. You'll face giants with God or without God. It doesn't matter where you live. There'll always be giants. The key to defeating giants is not in the moment. It's how you live your life every day. David got this. They're just obstacles. They're not my God-given opportunity. And if we don't get this, we're going to spend our lives being distracted by giants and those giants will determine our God rather than our God just taking out our giants. Church is important. We're not called to be giant slayers. God did not call me to take down giants. God called me to take the land. Don't miss this. Giants distract. That's all they do. They just sit there and stand on cliffs hurling taunts and insults. But all they are is just words and lies of the devil. David didn't go to the battle to face the giant. He faced the giant because the giant was in the way of what God wanted to do in giving victory in the land. When my humble people, Jesus said, Or God said, when my people humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, my people, I'll give them the land. But we let giants talk us down. We let giants belittle us. We let giants taunt us. But I'm not called to slay giants. I'm called to take the land. Being the real McCoy is something I do every day to be healthy, to be like Jesus. So when the giant comes, he's just in my way. We take him out and keep on doing what God called us to do because we got a mission to do, and I want to be missionally healthy. You ready for this? I don't want my financial struggles to keep people from going to heaven. I don't want my relational difficulties to keep people from going to heaven. And yet so many Christians do very little for God. You know why? Because their giant is all they focus on. And they say things like this. When I get financially healthy, we'll start giving and investing. You'll never get financially healthy because you don't know what that is. Because you don't even understand living in this country. You already are. Well, when we, when we get our marriage healthy, once our kids are grown, If you read in Numbers 13, when Joshua was about to enter the promised land, and I remind you, they were in bondage in Egypt, I thought God gave them a pretty big gift. I'm going to take you out of bondage. Anybody want to be a slave? No, no hands. Anybody like to be free? All of them put their hands up. And God said, good. I've got a guy named Moses. We're going to lead you to a land. I'm going to lead you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. What? What? I'm God. I have this piece of land over here. I'm going to give it to you. And you remember when they were leaving town? Woohoo! Yeah! They get into a cul de sac and there's a body of water, and here comes Pharaoh's armies, and they're like, oh, we'd rather die. God parts the water. Woohoo! <laughs> they get on the other side. God takes out the enemy. Now they're going, woohoo! They get to the promised land. They're at the edge of the Jordan. God tells Joshua, you send out 12 spies. Just go check it out. 
He's not saying go check it out to decide if you want to. He says, I'm going to let you go out. You check it out to come back and go, this is awesome. <laughs> Ten of them come back and say, we can't do it. Why? There's giants in the land. And God's like, I, I know, <laughs> but so am I. But they're giants, they're big. And God's like, listen, when I give you land, I'm going to give you everything in it. They're just giants. Little G. There's me, God. Big G. You just be the real McCoy. You just be faithful. All the giant can do is produce fear, and that fear will paralyze you. Watch this very carefully. Satan has the same goal as God. God wants you to be immovable, but when Satan fills you with fear and you believe you're giants, you become immovable too. One's standing on the rock. <laughs> One's Christian life is like a rock. But I think it's time for God to make the rocks cry out. And it's time for us to be broken before God. Church, listen, I'm going to show you how to stay on point. It's one word. I'm going to tell you as I close and I want the band to come up here. How do we take the land and not get distracted by giants? How do we live a life like David and be the real McCoy? It's real simple. It's one word. It's called remember. Just remember. Remember. Psalm 77, David writes, I'll remember the works of the Lord. Yes, I'll remember your wonders of old. And one of the greatest problems in the church right now is what I call spiritual amnesia. And one of the greatest weapons that we forego is our memory. Church, listen to this. A lot of victories are won because we remember. But a lot of battles have been fought and have been lost because we forget. Look what David writes in verse 36. In protecting my sheep, he says to King Saul, I killed both the lion and the bear. The Lord who delivered me from the teeth of that lion, the claws of the bear, will surely now deliver me from this Philistine too. He'd been doing this his life. Those sheep were so important. Instead of thinking about being king, I'm going to be the best shepherd I can. And these sheep matter to God. And I will take down anything. Because these sheep matter. I've done it once. I've been there before. I'll be there again. My God slays giants. I don't have to. My job is to be faithful. My job is to be the real McCoy. Church, this is so important we get this. We've all been there, haven't we? Where we thought we couldn't make it, but we did. We thought it would be over, but it wasn't. We felt like we were at the bottom, but we climbed out. Why? Because God. Whether you knew it or not, because of God. That's why Deuteronomy 8.10 says, remember what the Lord has done. Remember. Why is remembering so important? Because God never changes. If he did it once, he'll do it again and again and again and again and again and again. So this is why I struggle with communion, just FYI. I may be wrong in the sense, I have people going, we just need to do communion every day. We need to do communion every day. We need to have communion. And it breaks my heart because I sometimes think that we worship what we're doing rather than one who did it. So I just offer this, when the last time you took communion, did you shed tears? When's the last time you shed them? Do you understand what communion is? From the very beginning, God said, remember who I am. I'm the Lord your God. All these things that I've done, do not forget. Remember, write them on the precepts of your heart upon the forefront of your mind. Never let them get away. Remember, remember. And what does Jesus say before he goes to his death and he gathers his disciples? He breaks his body. He passes the cup and he says, remember. Remember what? What Jesus did in the cross. Do we just go through the motion and forget the precious blood that was spilled? because of our ugly side and our sinful messes and our own ideas. And Jesus, remember, don't forget what I did on that cross and broke forth, that I've made you as white as snow and death will never be able to speak into your life again. None of these giants have anything to say 
because not even the grave could hold me back. Don't forget. But I think the church has forgotten. I think we forgot. I've told you a story before. And I just want to share it again. It's been a long time, but it's about a father and a son who used to collect expensive artwork, but I'm not saying just any artwork. They had some of the most priceless around the world in their house. Picasso's, Rembrandt. Their most prized ones are right above their fireplace in their living room, and the boy and the father used to love to just sit and look at them. They loved to go to art collection, to auctions, and they would purchase, and they grew quite an incredible, lucrative, and a beautiful collection. A war came about, and the son was called out, It was only a few weeks later that the word came to the father that his son had been killed. It broke his father's heart. He went into seclusion and people didn't see him. Food was brought to the door, left. When they would leave, he would open it up, bring it in. Until one day there was a knock. It's interesting. Christmas morning father went to the door and he opened it up and there was a full dressed soldier with a package he said sir you don't know me but I think I know you pretty well I've learned through stories I was a friend of your son in fact I was with him the day he was killed can I come in reluctantly the father invited him in and they began to have a conversation the father asked how he died and what happened that day And everything changed when the soldier said, listen, I understand you like to collect art. He said, I like art too. I don't have any really expensive things in my collection, but I like to paint myself and I'd like to give you a gift. The father unwrapped the package and it was a portrait of his son. A beautiful, striking resemblance of his son. He quickly took the expensive stuff, the most expensive prize stuff from the mantle above the fireplace just threw it aside and hung the picture of the sun. They went on to the evening exchanging unbelievable pleasantries and then the soldier left. Years later, the art collecting world heard that the father had died as well. To their delight, finally, all of these priceless paintings will be auctioned off and sure enough, the auction date was set. And from all around the world, the most richest, the best art collectors came to bid on some of the most priceless work. They gathered in the home. The auctioneer stepped up in front of the fireplace in front of a pulpit like this. Let the auction begin, he said. Delight, energy filled the room. As people were so excited, and the auctioneer turned, he said, the first one up for bid is the one we're calling the sun. Deathly quiet in the room. Someone said, what's the sun? That has no value. Nobody painted that of any known understanding. Come on, let's get to the real stuff. He said, no, we must auction this one off first. Deathly quiet again, no one would bid. Finally, someone in the back, an older fella, he said, I'll give you $20. The place began to applaud, like, take it, take it, take it. And the auctioneer said, sold. The place erupted. Now we're going to get to bid on the good stuff. But then the gavel fell again. The auction is now over. You can imagine the anger in the room and frustration and people expressing But here's what the auctioneer said. He said, you need to understand, according to the will of the Father, whoever gets the Son gets it all. I want to be the real McCoy. Church, I have begged, I've pleaded, I've done everything. I've probably even sinned in some of my approach and preaching. I'm not afraid to say that. I'll do anything and everything. I'm just telling you this. I don't want to play church. I want to be the church. And the church is not something out here. It's not right here. It's here. When we say, I want to get spiritually healthy, I want to quit trying men to think that this marriage is what God wants it to be. The question is, is it? Is it? 
Is your family, is your work, is your life. The Bible says when we seek him with all our heart, we will find him. And no one loves more than God. No one wants more for my life than God. No one wants more for your life but that same God. That's why we're doing this. Here. That's why we're going to do what we do next week. That's why I said come. Come prepared. I've already been baptized. I'm not, I don't care. It ain't about that. It's about a moment in time of us this week deciding we're going to, we're going to, we're, we're done playing the game. God, I want to go in that water and I want to come out. I want you to just wash it. I really want to seek you. I want to be a testimony of the world from this day forward. I'm going to stumble, but I'm going to get up. I'm going to own it. But I want to be the real McCoy. I want to be the real deal. I want to be you, Jesus, in the world because I only have one shot at this and that, that window's getting less and less. Father, he who gets the sun gets it all. Our world desperately needs, especially in this country, the name of Jesus lifted up. Not in a legalistic way, not in an ugly, demeaning way, but to let our light shine in a beautiful, bright, wonderful way. God, it starts in our heart when we do business with you to be healthy relationally, financially, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. God, in every area of our lives, we just want to be the real McCoy. God, like David, never forget who you are, what you've done, and watch you <laughs> redeem the land. God, we say thanks.